All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Bruner, and I am the Exotic Forest Pest Educator with Purdue University's Department of Entomology. Today, we're going to be talking about the Asian Longhorn Beetle. Now, before we get started, the first thing I want to say is that the materials you are going to see in this presentation are not mine. They were the work of Carrie Tauscher, Elizabeth Barnes, and Cliff Sadoff, and I want to make sure we give special thanks to them for the effort they put into this. And as always, for those of you watching this recording on YouTube or elsewhere, if you see any images in here that don't have proper accreditation to them, um, please email me, let me know, and I will go through and make sure that that is corrected. All right, with that, why don't we go ahead and dive into our presentation on this particular bug. So first things first, we always want to have a good understanding of where these insects come from and how they begin to spread throughout our country. And like many other insects that we deal with, the Asian longhorn beetle, like its name indicates, arrived from Asia. Much like with other insects, particularly emerald ash borer, its introduction was accidental. It was first discovered in Brooklyn in 1996 in some solid packing wood material. So pallets, other kind of packaging that you could find. This is where this insect was able to hide and accidentally get shipped here. Now, this isn't a unique occurrence just in the United States. Uh, this insect is an international problem, and it is even spreading within its home range. So there is nowhere on Earth you will find this insect that it is welcomed. It is definitely a problem no matter where you go if it is present. Now, to give you an idea of how it looks so far in the United States, what you're looking at here is a map that was put out by a variety of people working in the field in the USDA. And what they did is they mapped out locations where Asian longhorn beetle had been identified. And either it was identified and it is currently being regulated until it is fully eradicated out of an area, or, as indicated by the green marks, it has been discovered and then eradicated completely and has since gone into deregulation for that area. So basically, red means it's present and it's being worked on. Green means that it was present and it's been eliminated. There is one last indicator on this map too, the blue symbol, that means that there is an active infestation that is known about. And if you look closely in South Carolina, if you look where I have this circle now highlighting it, you can see that towards the coast there is a location in South Carolina in Hollywood where it was detected in August of 2020. Now this map is current as of 2020, so there may be a few additional locations to be added on here. However, you can be fairly certain that USDA and their partners are working very actively to make sure that this insect does not spread any further, because this insect does represent a very serious threat to a lot of our trees. Now, a little bit on Asian longhorn beetle life cycle. Um, most of the insects that you've seen me talk about have really, really well-defined life cycles and times of the year where you can actually rely on them being present. The trouble with Asian longhorn beetle is that they aren't really constrained too terribly except by the winter season. So at any given point, you may be able to find different portions of its life cycle present. Um, now, what we have is if we look and we start with the adult beetle, what we're going to see is that females will chew an oviposition pit into the bark. And you can actually see that on some of the pictures here in front of you a little bit. You'll see scarring on the surface that has a very, very oval or circular look, and it will look like a little pit. And they're going to lay their eggs in that. Now those eggs are going to develop over time, given the right amount of temperature, and the larva will eventually hatch out. And you can see that proceeding forward as the early stage larva begins to chew its way through the tree. And if you look at the images over on the right side, you can see a gallery where there is a larva sitting, and it's just sitting right in one of the galleries that it's been feeding in. The larva will develop until it reaches a point where it's going to crawl through one of its galleries and then chew a new chamber where it's going to pupate. And you can see that this pupa that's on this image is a little bit different than what you may think of. Traditionally, when we think of a pupa, we typically think of like a moth cocoon or chrysalis. And those tend to completely cover what's going on inside of them. Well, the pupa of this beetle and many other beetle species is what's known as exorate. So that means that the pupa will literally be the shape of the bug that it's developing into. Um, sometimes they'll move around a tiny bit. They can't really 
move their legs or anything like that. They can really just kind of wiggle or crawl. But for the most part, this pupa is going to stay in that chamber in the tree until it fully develops into its adult form and eventually emerge from an emergence hole it, that if you look at the left side of the screen, you can actually see emergence holes that are slightly smaller than the size of a dime, which is very, very large. Now it's important to keep in mind that these larvae, what they are feeding on is they are kind of going deep into the tree's bark. They're not going to stay super close to the surface. They're actually going to be going more towards, let's say, within individual limbs and shoots. They're going to be going for the pith. They are going to chew a little bit of the cambrium to feed on phloem and other material, but they do tend to go a little bit deeper than the other insects that I've talked about in the past. All right, so one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that Asian longhorn beetle can have a few different look-alikes amongst our native beetles. Um, thankfully, there are several traits about the Asian longhorn beetle that you can use to help you out. So if we look at the picture all the way on the left of the actual Asian longhorn beetle itself, you can see that this beetle has a very shiny black appearance with those white dots on, its, on the surface of its body. It also has blue-tinged legs, which will definitely stand out to you. And then you can always look for the striped antenna that are um, alternating kind of a pale, very pale blue or white with black. Now the ones that are probably going to be most confused with are going to be these white pot spotted pine sawyers in the middle image right there. The beetles are actually in similar groups, so they're going to have a lot of body morphology that's going to resemble each other. Uh, and you can kind of see that if you compare those two images. However, the white spotted pine sawyer, yeah, it does have white spots on it. They are a little bit random, but they're not nearly as dark. They lack the blue coloration on the legs, and their antenna aren't striped. So you can use that as a tool to kind of inform you as to what you're looking at. And then another one that some folks may confuse is the cottonwood borer. Now the cottonwood borer really starts with a base of that kind of cream color or white, and then it has black spotting on it, but out of the corner of your eye, you may confuse it. And if you look closely, you can see that the legs do have a little bit of a blue tinge on them. But the easy way you can get around that is simply observe a little bit more closely. That um, Asian longhorn beetle is very shiny, and it is very, very black. So that can be a trait that you can use to differentiate between Asian longhorn beetles and cottonwood borers. Now, the reason Asian longhorn beetles are so nasty, the whole reason that we're discussing them today is because of what they can do to a tree. There are very few insects that are quite as lethal to a tree as an Asian longhorn beetle. Um, sadly, the one of the biggest problems we have with them is that by the time you notice their presence, it is probably already too late to save that tree. So for example, there's this lovely picture here taken by Dr. Cliff Sadoff of this maple. And if you look at this maple, we're looking kind of at the crown. Uh, you can see a few problem areas. There's maybe a little bit of dead branching there, only a little though. And the leaves are still a nice green. Glancing at this, you may think, oh, this is a tree that's just fine. We don't have any problems. But if we look a little closer, we notice that there's actually quite a few problems going on. What you're looking at here is most likely overposition pits, where the Asian longhorn beetle has infested this tree and it has laid its eggs. And then what we can do is we can cut individual shoots or branches to look a little closer, and we discover that the tree is in fact infested. This is why this beetle can be so problematic, because you can see it's not feeding on the material that's directly underneath the bark. You can see a little bit of damage there. It does feed on some of the cambrium, some of that phloem where the nutrients are really gathered. But what they do is they hollow out the very center of it. And that's where they chew through their galleries and get their most of their nutrition out of. This makes it so that treating them and properly identifying them is a very serious challenge unless you are an expert or have something like an arborist or forester on hand who can help you identify these. Now, what we can do to identify the presence of this insect is a few things, and they, for the most part, they're very, very reliable. The first thing that we can do is we can look for the oviposition pits because they really do stand out. Those chewed areas that are kind of oval or circular shaped, little dips down into the bark, little concave impressions and those make a really good indicator that Asian longhorn beetle has been present. 
Obviously, the other thing is, is if you are really investigating your tree closely and cut into it, finding the larva. Um, very few other insects have larva quite this large that are going to go in a tree, and their body shape is very consistent. So that makes it very easy to identify in that regard. The other thing you can look for are the emergence holes themselves. Note what this picture is telling you. There is a number two pencil that is fitting very deeply inside that emergence hole, and it looks like it's pretty comfortable. So that gives you an idea of the size of the insect and the size of the hole that they're going to leave behind. And then one last thing that you can use to look for the presence of these beetles is look for little piles of kind of nasty sawdust that's gathering in the crooks of the trees between the branches. That sawdust there, that's not evidence of a woodpecker being active or something else. That is straight up just an Asian longhorn beetle having chewed its way into the tree and pushing out the junk that it's chewed and it's, it's poop basically, it's frass, and other material. And those are all combined very good indicators that you can use if your tree has been infested. And unfortunately, if you do have an infestation, most likely the best step is to probably remove the tree. So a little bit on the movement of these insects. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying, and it's already pointed out here on the slide too, they like to reinfest trees. If they find a host that is suitable, they're going to keep coming back to that host year after year. And you can imagine if they are just boring holes straight through trees year after year, that tree is probably not going to be around for a long time. Now they are able to move and they can move quite a bit of distance. Uh, according to some research that's been done on them, they can fly on average 1.4 miles when they search for a new host or a mate, but they can also fly up to eight and a half miles. That's a pretty big range, especially in an area such as Indiana, where we have a significant amount of hardwood. They can also be found infesting firewood, pallets. They can be found in lumber or logs, as well as other wood products. So for those of you who don't work specifically with lumber or wood, this means that we want you to pay attention to things like your firewood. Um, you'll probably recall 15 years ago or more now, we were telling you don't move the firewood because of the emerald ash borer. That is still very true. We are asking, nay begging you, please, if you are using firewood, use it where it lay. You know, if you are getting it off your own property, leave it on your property. Uh, don't sell it, just keep it there, use it, and that way we can try to prevent the spread of this insect as much as possible. And this will also remain true for several other insects too, not just the Asian longhorn beetle. And if you've been to any of my other programs or watched them on my YouTube channel, you'll find that this will be true for insects such as spotted lanternfly. Um, obviously those areas where emerald ash borer is still a problem uh, and several others. So please don't move the firewood. So one of the things that we want to do is that identifying and understanding the life cycle of this insect is actually fairly easy. And it may actually be more effective to teach you the trees to watch out for and to monitor um, just in case Asian longhorn beetle begins to come into your area. With any luck, those of us in Indiana will for the most part avoid this, but it's always good to be prepared because this is a nasty insect for our trees. So why don't we start off with the most preferred hosts of this insect. So if we start with our most preferred or very good host, we're going to find that these insects will go after all species of maple, which is very unfortunate because we have a lot of maple here in Indiana, and we have a decent amount of maple syrup development in our state. We have uh, horse chestnuts or buckeyes is another very good host, as well as elm trees, willow, and that's pretty much it for the very good hosts. Now, the real problem starts to come in with our other hosts. So if we look at the way these insects are going to choose their habitat, we're going to operate off the assumption that they're going to go for the best host they can get first. You know, they want to go to where the best food is, and they're gonna, they want their young to feed on that food. But if they overpopulate a tree, they're not going to expect to get as much out of it anymore. They're fighting with each other on it. So then they're going to go to their next preferred host. And if we look at that list, unfortunately, it's significantly larger. So we've got birch, sycamore, poplar, mimosa, katsura, ash, golden rain tree, mountain ash, hackberry, and I'm sure there are actually several more that just simply aren't included on here. 
Um, now, some of those trees you may not find quite as commonly in Indiana, but just looking at that list, uh, birch, sycamore, poplar, mimosa, um, what few ash we still have, and hackberry are all definitely trees that are present and at risk from this insect. So it will represent a nasty problem for us. So going now into host plant ID, I know a lot of you are probably fairly familiar with ID identifying your trees, but it's always good to get a refresher on that one. And for those of you who aren't as good at it, well, and here's a little bit of a lesson you can use. So let's start with our maples. Maples are perhaps one of the easiest to identify. Um, we just look for trees that have a leaf on it that resembles the Canadian flag, those nice pointy lobed leaves that are common on all maples, so there are a few variations therein. Um, the branching on the tree is going to be opposite, so where you have one branch directly on the opposite side of the tree or limb, there will be another branch. They also have winged seeds, though their wings are actually fairly small compared to other trees that do, and these winged seeds are called schizocarps. Now, primarily we are going to be talking about sugar maples here with this one because they're going to probably be the first tree they're going to hit. And we can use that as an example because it makes such an easy one to identify. So you're looking at leaves that are five lobed with smooth margins and green flowers. The buds are gonna be small and pointed, but their seeds are gonna be fairly large and full. And like I said, the wings are, sharp, are short and the bark is going to be a little bit peely or plate-like, but that is going to be dependent on region. For example, if I look at the sugar maple that's in my backyard, it doesn't really have that peely or plate-like bark. So it depends on where you live and maybe what cultivars that have been planted up this tree. Moving on, if we talk about our horse chestnuts or buckeyes, this is another one that's actually fairly easy to identify. If we think about it, buckeyes themselves, the seeds, they're very, very easy to identify. They are very hard seeds with that telltale eye shape in the middle of them that you can see with a very glossy appearance. As for the tree itself, the bark tends to be pocked and messy with no obvious or clear patterning to it. The buds will be very big and sticky. And you're also going to find that the leaves are palmately compound. Now what this means is if we look at the image there in the top right, you can see that there are two of the leaves right there. Now those are actually the whole leaf themselves. You have the petiole of the leaf with a certain number of leaflets attached to it. That those aren't individual leaves. One way you can check to see if it's palmately compound, if it is indeed the leaf of a horse chestnut, when you break the leaf off of a tree, it will always break off um, normally where the uh, petiole meets its point of abscission, it's called, or uh, the place where the petiole meets the actual branch or twig. If it breaks off cleanly, that was you found the spot where the leaf connects to the tree. However, if you went up to one of these leaflets here and you tried breaking it off from the other leaflets it's attached to, it won't do so easily at all. That's because this is all one leaf. It's meant to stay together. So you can use that to help you identify these. So a little bit more on the Buckeyes as for their flowers. I love the way their flowers look. They have panicle flowers that stick up. They're kind of pretty. They do smell a little sickly sweet though. So sometimes the smell can be off-putting. And I have discussed already what the seeds look like. They're very telltale. Um, they have that kind of rough area surrounded by glossiness on the, um, the rest of it. And I imagine that a few of you probably have seen plenty of Buckeyes before as maybe decoration or you grow horse chestnut yourself. All right, a little bit on elms. Um, unfortunately, elm took really nasty hit to their populations back in the early 20th century due to the spread of Dutch elm disease. But we are seeing elms begin to develop in a lot of different places, which is very nice. Um, however, they are one of the very good hosts for this insect, so we want to make sure you can identify them. Uh, their identification is fairly simple. They have simple alternate leaves and branching. Um, they have an asymmetrical leaf base, so you could see that in the leaf that this person is holding and the bark can be kind of scaly. That bark right there, if you look at the bottom right image, is very telltale of the presence of an elm. I personally also tend to think that an elm tree itself reminds me of like a broccoli floret a little bit. 
and then willow as our last tree that we can discuss here. Willows are have a real obvious shape and look to them. And in Indiana, we actually have quite a bit of willow that we grow across it. It makes for a good riparian tree, and it does also make for a good tree in your landscaping. Now, willows have thin lanceolate leaves that have serrated margins, and they have a single very prominent midrib. And you can see that kind of almost on the tree, there's a reason we call them weeping willows. They kind of look a little bit like it's tears or water coming down. Um, some of the early cottonwood fluff could be coming from willow trees as they're going through their activities. Now the buds are very, very tiny and they are held very tight to the twig or branch. And you can see that in the bottom leftmost image there where that bud is just hanging right on to the side of the tree. Weeping willows are going to be our most common willow, though there are some other ones grown here in Indiana. Um, and one thing to also keep in mind is that willows and a lot of the other trees we've discussed do have their own sets of diseases that they deal with. So we want to make sure not to confuse um, disease issues with the presence of Asian longhorn beetle. So I've talked a lot about the Asian longhorn beetle and what it's capable of. So what do we want you to do? The most important thing is to report. This is one of the nastiest threats to our trees that we have. So it is important that we know exactly where they are, when they are. And what you can do is you can report them using edmaps.org. There's a very simple system on it to get reporting done. You can also go to the Great Lakes Early Detection Network or gledden.org to do the same thing. You can call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC or this phone number in front of you right now. That will take you straight to DNR's reporting line. I will hear of it. The people over at DNR will hear of it and we will be able to act on that information. Um, you can also go to reportinvasive.com and that will have on there instructions on where can you report things and what do some insects or other pests look like to get information. Or you can also email us. Now, uh, my email, you probably already have it. You can also leave a comment here on this YouTube video and I will put it in the, in the description on this video as well. When you report these, when you call us or email us, uh, we are asking that you tell us where you were when you saw this. You can take a picture and please give us the best picture you can. You can also take a sample and you can e uh, mail it, not email, mail it to the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. Though um, normally what I would ask you first to do is send us a picture first because that way we don't accidentally get something in the mail that might not be good to have in the mail. Um, another thing you can do too is if you are worried about trying to identify things is there's this great resource called Purdue Plant Doctor. It is a website. Um, it works very well on mobile so you can access it on your phone just by going to www.purdueplantdoctor.com and it will lead you through all sorts of instructions on either how to identify something or if you put in the name of something to help you learn how to identify it. And it's very easy to use. It comes in both English and Spanish versions. And with that, I want to get in my traditional plug to see something, say something on spotted lanternfly or any other invasive species that we may be concerned about here in Indiana. You can also find my contact information as well as information on our social media. Take a look at the Purdue Landscape Report or the Emerald Ash Warrior University on YouTube. Uh, Penn State Extension is also a great resource to go to if you have questions on invasive species. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, and I hope I see you all at the next one.